and we are very glad you could join us for the second event in the school speaker series this year. Our theme for the year is Renewing America's Civic Compact. This is the school's fifth year in organizing this series. It's an effort that we call the Civic Discourse Project. Uh, and as I noted uh, about a month ago for our annual Constitution Day lecture in September, we are delighted to be returning to in-person events in the Civic Discourse Project after about 18 months uh, of conducting only webinars. So thank you for attending. You are, whether you know it or not, you are rebuilding American Civic Discourse with us. As we return to in-person events, uh, as you can see, we are very happy to be uh, in partnership again with Arizona PBS, recording all of our events. We're live streaming uh, tonight's event, so we ask everybody to behave. Uh, uh, edited, edited episodes uh, will be available on the Arizona PBS website and also on the school's website. We encourage you to look for all of the school's uh, speaker events and webinars for the past, uh, this is the beginning of our fifth year, so for the past four years. They're available on our website, which is scetl.asu.edu. Uh, and you can find that under events and then the Civic Discourse Project. And on the theme of civic discourse, we're happy to have with us tonight several civic leaders from the Arizona community, also ASU faculty and staff from other units. I want to just briefly mention a few people. Lindell Manson, who's the chair of the Arizona Board of Regents. Larry Penley, the past chair of ABOR and the current treasurer. We have leaders and members from ASU's ROTC detachments and staff from Arizona's congressional delegation and from the state legislature and staff from ABOR as well. We also, I think, have some leaders here from the ASU administration. Our school has worked pretty hard for five years now to try to convene a high-level conversation and discourse in the Civic Discourse Project. Single speakers, dialogue events, and annual conference. Together, we try to encompass a range of academic and intellectual and civic views. The intellectual diversity that we feature tries to exemplify civil disagreement. And we are also arguing for its importance in American higher education and American society. This public project is the extension of the same spirit in our academic program. Our curriculum, our degrees, our student experiences, all trying to reconnect a liberal arts education with an American civic education. And since our distinguished guest tonight is going to address civic education, I should note that the school and our Center for Political Thought and Leadership co-led a national study on civic education in K-12 schools that issued its final report earlier this year. That report is entitled Educating for American Democracy. As one of the co-authors, I can tell you it is exciting reading <laughs> on a very important topic. And, and the school and the center are now working on implementing the study's recommendations with schools and, and uh, educational leaders in Arizona and in other states. Uh, and, and in fact, General Master, McMaster and I have talked about it, and he's interested in supporting that uh, larger project, so we look forward to working with him on that. So now, to briefly briefly and not so adequately introduce our distinguished speaker, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. Dr. McMaster is the Fuad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and at Stanford University. He is also an Arizona State University Distinguished University Fellow. He's a native of Philadelphia and he graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1984. He served as an Army officer for 34 years and retired as a Lieutenant General in 2018. He remained on active duty while serving as the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security, National Security Affairs in the Trump Administration, serving from 2017 through into 2018. During his military career, HR served as a history professor at West Point, and he holds a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So while he is a great American public servant and a Spartan, he also became something of an Athenian and a scholar, and he will share that blend with us tonight. In war colleges and in the military academies and in many civilian universities today, a modern classic of civil military relations is H.R.'s 1997 book adapted from his doctoral dissertation, Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Lies That Led to Vietnam. 
His recent book, published in 2020, after his service as National Security Advisor to the President, is Battlegrounds, the Fight to Defend the Free World. Our format tonight is that HR will speak for about 40 minutes, and then I'll join him on stage uh, to, to pose some very aggressive and hostile uh, follow-up questions. <clears throat> and then in the third part of the evening, General McMaster will take questions from the audience, and we invite everyone to stay for a reception. So with that, please join me in welcoming H.R. McMaster to discuss history and civic education as the foundation of strategic confidence. Paul, thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming out. It's great to see people in three dimensions. How cool is that? And, uh, and, and I want to thank Paul and, and Carol McNamara for the, the privilege of, of just being associated with, I think, is a really important project at the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And, uh, and, and I really appreciate what you're doing to bring Americans together to help restore confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. And, and, and it's, it's, it's great to be here at ASU as well. And in particular, uh, I really admire the way ASU has made, has made education entrepreneurial and made it more accessible to so many, so, so many more uh, people and so, so many more students. In the conclusion of Battlegrounds, I quote the historian of technology, Elting Morrison, uh, who wrote in the 1960s that to live safely in our society, let alone manage it, will require continuous education until a person dies. And that's why I really applaud what this university has done to make high quality education more accessible, not just to those who are the typical demographic for undergraduate students, uh, but, for, but for those who may have left higher education and want to come back to it, uh, I think what the, what the university has done in remote learning uh, to, to keep it as, as high quality as, 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 as uh, learning in person too is, is really admirable. And, and I think it's important because education, I think, is foundational to our society and extremely important now, this year and the coming years, if we're going to emerge stronger from the traumas that we have experienced. And of course, those traumas include a pandemic, you know, a, a recession associated with the pandemic, social divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the violent aftermath, and of course, vitriolic partisan political divisions that we saw culminate in, in an assault on our, on our capital. Uh, and, and all of this, I think, has, has reduced our confidence, our confidence in our, in our democratic principles and institutions and, and processes. And of course, now add on to those traumas the humanitarian, political, and security crises that are just now beginning as a result of what I would describe as self-defeat in Afghanistan. We cannot regain our confidence, however, without improving our competence. And, and this is what I'd like to spend some time talking about, is the need for us to improve our strategic competence. The catastrophe we are witnessing in Afghanistan I believe is the result of incompetence. Incompetence based in strategic narcissism or the propensity to define the world only in relation to us and then to assume what we decide to do is decisive toward achieving, uh, uh, decisive in achieving a positive outcome. The problem with that tendency, of course, is that it does not acknowledge the agency, influence, and authorship over the future that the other, especially, enemies, adversaries, and rivals enjoy. In Afghanistan, a lack of what the historian Zachary Shore calls strategic empathy resulted in policies and strategies across two decades that were based on what we, the purveyor, preferred rather than what the situation demanded. Strategic narcissism led to self-delusion, and self-delusion provided a rationale for self-defeat. So what might we learn from the lost war in Afghanistan so we can begin to overcome strategic narcissism and begin to rebuild our competence? We might relearn that war and competition short of war are interactive and that progress in war or diplomacy is never linear. The war in Afghanistan and the long war against jihadist terrorist organizations is not over. It is entering a new, and I would think, more dangerous era. 
because many of our leaders have been pretending otherwise, much of what you hear about our self-defeat in Afghanistan is the opposite of reality. So learning from our failure, recovering from the catastrophe, and rebuilding our competence, I think will require our leaders to stop pretending. Stop pretending that our surrender to the Taliban in February 2020 and subsequent concessions to that terrorist organization, which strengthened our enemies and weakened our Afghan allies, were not the principal reasons for the lost war and its consequences. The psychological blows that we delivered to our Afghan allies included negotiating with the Taliban without participation of the Afghan government, not insisting on a ceasefire, forcing the Afghan government to release 5,000 terrorists, curtailing intelligence support, ending active support of the Taliban, withdrawing all of our aircraft from the country, and then terminating contractor support to Afghan forces. Stop pretending that we can end so-called endless wars by withdrawal. Wars do not end when one party disengages and our enemies are waging an endless jihad. We failed to learn from our complete withdrawal from Iraq in December 2011 and the subsequent resurgence of Al Qaeda in Iraq, which morphed into ISIS. By the summer of 2014, ISIS had gained control of territory the size of Britain and became the most destructive terrorist organization in history. Remember, conducting 195 international attacks. So as the English philosopher and theologian G.K. Chesterton observed, war may not be the best way of settling differences, but it may be the only way to ensure that they're not settled for you. Stop pretending that all of our efforts in Afghanistan were wasted. Progress is impossible to disavow as we watch the Taliban reverse gains and reinstate the horrors endured during the Taliban rule from 1996 to 2001. It is true that Afghanistan was not transformed into Denmark, but Afghanistan only needed to be Afghanistan with a government hostile to jihadist terrorists and security forces strong enough to withstand the regenerative capacity of the Taliban. Stop pretending that the outcome would have been better if we had simply left Afghanistan after the successful military campaign in 2001. We might call this the, the George Costanza approach to war, when you just leave on a high note. The consolidation of gains, of military gains, has never been an optional phase in, in war. The notion that the Taliban would have accepted a negotiated agreement uh, consistent with our objectives in Afghanistan earlier in the war is just another element of our self-delusion. Stop pretending that America cannot generate the will for sustained military efforts abroad. Sustained efforts in Korea, the Sinai, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Colombia are just a few examples of successful and sustained long-term efforts. Those who cite public opinion polls that favor withdrawal should attribute lack of support to leaders' failure to explain what is at stake in the war and the strategy for achieving an outcome worthy of the costs, risks, and sacrifices. By 2018, a very low level uh, of, of, of multinational military and financial support were enabling Afghans to bear the brunt of the fight against the enemies of all civilized peoples. Stop pretending that there are short-term solutions to long-term problems. Afghanistan was not a 20-year-long war. It was a one-year war fought 20 times over, and it was our short-term approach to a long-term problem that actually paradoxically increased the cost and increased the length of the war. Declarations of withdrawal across three administrations emboldened our enemies, sowed doubts among our allies, in encouraged hedging behavior, perpetuated corruption, and weakened state institutions. Stop pretending that adversaries will conform to our preferences or that we can fight enemies we wish we had rather than our actual enemies. 
until the base motivation of its army changes, Pakistan will not be a partner against terrorist organizations. The Taliban has not changed, is completely intertwined with other jihadist terrorists, and is determined to reinstate brutal Sharia. The reestablishment of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is as much a victory for Al Qaeda and other jihadists as it is for the Taliban. The notion of partnering with the Taliban to fight terrorism is like partnering with Whitey Bulger or Tony Soprano to fight organized crime. Stop pretending that vilification from the international community will influence the Taliban. The notion that enemies of all humanity who are determined to force Afghanistan back into the seventh century, or an organization led by Haibatullah Akhanzada, who encouraged his 17-year-old son to commit murder as a suicide bomber at the age of 17, are concerned about chiding tweets or disapproving speeches is ludicrous. Stop pretending that the military instrument can be separated from diplomacy. As the late George Schultz, a very distinguished colleague uh, at the Hoover Institution, who is being remembered in a memorial service actually uh, today in San Francisco, as, as he stated, negotiation is a euphemism for capitulation unless the shadow of power is cast across the bargaining table. Civilian and military leaders said that, you know, there's no military solution in Afghanistan. But the Taliban, their Pakistani sponsors, and their al-Qaeda allies clearly came up with one. More diplomacy with the Taliban without the prospect of force will achieve nothing but further embarrassment. Finally, stop pretending that it is acceptable to fight wars without a commitment to win. Winning in Afghanistan meant achieving the just intention of ensuring that Afghanistan never again became a safe haven for jihadist terrorists. Because in war, each side tries to outdo the other, a lack of a commitment to win is counterproductive. And according to Thomas Aquinas' Jus ad Bellum theory, it is also unethical, unethical to fight without determination to succeed. Our leaders invented new terms like responsible end as a cover for their ambiv ambivalence as they sent soldiers into battle. Unless we stop pretending and demand better from our leaders, the prospect of learning from our searing experience in South Asia, rebuilding our strategic competence, and effacing the stain of 2021 will remain dim. Because we are engaged in consequential competitions, not only against jihadist terrorist organizations, but also rival states, China and Russia, as well as the theocratic dictatorship in Tehran, and the only hereditary communist dictatorship in Pyongyang, it is urgent that we stop pretending, regain our strategic competence, and rebuild the confidence necessary to compete against rivals, adversaries, and enemies. The greatest opportunity to defend against China and Russia may lie in strengthening democratic governance, rule of law, and freedom of expression at home and abroad. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and rule of law helps expose malign Chinese and Russian influence and prosecute those who enable it. That is why support for democratic institutions and processes and the unalienable rights that should be afforded to all peoples is not just an exercise in altruism, it is also a practical means of countering the Chinese Communist Party's campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment, and Russia's campaign of, of disruption, disinformation, and denial. We should be confident. Democracy is resilient, while authoritarian and totalitarian dictatorships are brittle. And the traumas we are experiencing today, let's just realize they are not unprecedented. Think back to the 1970s, for those of you who are in that demographic, not too many here, I guess, maybe, <laughs> who can think back to the 1970s. Our, our, you know, our nation was, was deeply divided over race and an unpopular war. 
the Watergate scandal and the cover-up of that scandal led to President Richard Nixon's resignation. Other events shook America's confidence, such as the Vietnamese communist assault on Saigon and the desperate evacuation of the American embassy in April 1975. Stagflation and oil crises added economic traumas. The decade ended with an Iranian revolution, a failed hostage rescue attempt, and a 444-day-long hostage crisis. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union appeared strong. Like Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, Soviet leaders back then saw America's tolerance for civil and political liberties as a vulnerability. But the struggles of the 1970s belied American strength. We might like look back to the speech that President Ronald Reagan delivered at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin on June 12, 1987. Today, leaders across the free world have an opportunity to clarify with exhortations like Reagan's, tear down this wall, what is at stake in the competition with the Chinese Communist Party and the Kremlin? The Berlin Wall is an apt metaphor for Putin's and Xi Jinping's persecution of journalists and the Great Firewall of China because they are efforts to isolate the realm of authoritarian regimes from outside influences. If Chairman Xi and President Putin are confident in their systems, they should welcome open competition and allow their citizens to access multiple sources of information and judge for themselves. And it is important not only to, as Reagan did, ex explain clearly what is at stake in the competition with our authoritarian regimes, but also to restore confidence in our democracy. This is where all of us can help. All of us have a role in this. We can advance the mission of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, and we can take, as the school does, an interdisciplinary approach to examine great ideas and help understand better how we can improve our nation. Because we have the good fortune of living in a democracy. Wang An, who migrated to the United States from China in the 1950s and founded the groundbreaking computer company Wang Laboratories, said of his adopted country that as a nation, we do not always live up to our ideals. But we have structures that allow us to correct our wrongs by means short of revolution. Citizens in the United States and across the free world should recognize that we have agency and we can demand better from our leaders and from one another to overcome our differences, reinforce the fabric of our societies, and work together to strengthen our nations across the free world. Education can help us empathize with one another. Today, it seems that those who know the least about issues and who are strangers to their fellow Americans seek affirmation of their biases rather than knowledge. They judge their neighbors rather than try to understand their perspectives. Ignorance drives a destructive interaction between identity politics, vitriolic partisan rhetoric, bigotry, and racism. Education in history, kind of predictable for a historian to say, is particularly important. The manipulation of history remains an important tool, not only for the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir Putin's Kremlin, but also for some of our fellow Americans who prefer to sow division and conflict rather than foster unity and goodwill. Ignorance of history compounded by the abuse of history undermines our ability to work together to improve our nation because it saps our pride. As the late philosopher Richard Rorty observed, national pride is to countries what self-respect is to individuals, a necessary condition for self-improvement. Of course, pride should not derive from a, a contrived happy view of history, but rather a recognition that our experiment in freedom and democracy always was and remains a work in progress. We are still coping with the legacy of slavery, the emancipation of four million of our fellow Americans after the most destructive war in our history was only the beginning of a long journey for equal rights. Milestones along that journey included the failure of Reconstruction 
Jim Crow segregation and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and, and separate but equal. But in the 1960s, the civil rights movement dismantled the legal basis for Jim Crow segregation, but of course cultural, economic, educational, and other forms of disenfranchisement continued. But it is important to note that it was the manipulation of history that was foundational to the obstruction of equal rights for black Americans, as the myth of the lost cause portrayed slavery as benign instead of cruel, and the Civil War as a noble effort to preserve states' rights rather than to preserve slavery. But it is also important to know that it is an abuse of history to cast the American Revolution as an effort to preserve slavery rather than a righteous struggle to found our nation on principles that ultimately rendered that horrible institution unsustainable. Knowledge of history should encourage Americans to celebrate the principles enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution while recognizing that work remains to realize them. If we, if we do believe uh, that all of us, if all of us believe that we can work together to build a better future, then we should be particularly skeptical of those who want to put the word systemic in front of every problem we face. It is a word that is often used to rob us of agency and encourage a toxic combination of anger and resignation. It is possible to improve equality of opportunity and access to quality education so that the zip code into which one is born does not impede access to the great promise of America. It is possible to protect our privacy from the avarice of social media companies and counter disinformation while preserving freedom of speech. It is possible to ensure voting rights while improving security and transparency of elections. It is possible to overcome racism, sexism, and other forms of bigotry without surrendering individual agency or succumbing to reified philosophies that promote victimhood as the new heroism and teach our children that they are defined more by their identity category than their character. We should be confident in our ability to build a better future at home and compete more effectively abroad. Democracy is resilient. Totalitarianism is brittle. Consider Xi Jinping's speech in July 2021 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. It contained a combination of admonishments, warnings, threats, and of course, you know, lots of praise for the 95 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. But Xi and his friend Vladimir Putin are very much aware of another anniversary this year the 30th anniversary of Mikhail Gorbachev's resignation and the end of the Soviet Union. So as I, I look at this audience and I look at the, the amazing students and, and faculty uh, at ASU, I'm, I'm confident in, in our future. I'm confident because the education here at ASU will help our nation provide a better future. But we can all do our part. We can tell our leaders to stop pretending and demand competence. We need not wait for the political class to restore our confidence in our common identity as Americans and in our democratic principles and institutions. Let us resolve to live well, to cherish the freedom so many fought to preserve, and to realize the motto that appears on the great seal of the Republic, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. As the patriot and civil rights activist Rosa Parks observed, we will fail only if we fail to try. Thank you. Gosh, you guys have comfortable chairs here at ASU. It's awesome. <laughs> Try to stay alert. Try. Yeah. Wait. I'll be nice. Wait till, we get, wait till you get to the audience questions. They really, the audience is tough. So thank you for those remarks. Let me start with your, your invocation of civil rights leaders like Rosa Parks uh, and Martin Luther King. So outside at the information table, you can pick up a copy of our school's pocket constitution 
which adds to the Declaration and the Constitution Abraham Lincoln's 1963, I'm sorry, 1863 Gettysburg Address and Martin Luther King's 1963 I Have a Dream Address. Yeah. So the, your, your invocation of, of the civil rights leaders, after having talked about Afghanistan and strategic narcissism, this may seem odd to people. <laughs> how, how could a national security expert and a general and a recent former national security advisor to the president, how could you, why would you care about yeah. the history of the civil rights uh, movement? I mean, having read Battlegrounds, and you know, I know that right. you do, but just to, some people might say, well, what this, these are, you know, yeah. how, why, why would he be talking about, caring about connecting these two, these two issues? Right, I mean, I, I do believe that our lack of confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes, our, our lack of confidence you can sense sometimes, at least from the public debates and what's out there in, 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 our, in our information environment, you know, are, are oftentimes, I think, based in this idea that Americans don't have agency, right? And that's what I really worry about more than anything. Heck, yes, we have problems. Yes, there is inequality of opportunity in this country. There's much work to be done uh, to, to make sure that er everyone has equal access, right, to the, to, and, and can take advantage of the great promise of America. Uh, but, but once we acknowledge that, let's get to work, you know, and, and stop acting as if uh, that we don't have a degree of agency. And, and I think that, you know, I'm worried about the effect that this lack of confidence has uh, on our military as well. You know, I served in our army for 34 years. And I think that a lot of what you see in our society, if it infects our military, can be destructive to our ability to fight. Now, if you just go to the one theme of the talk was this idea of national pride being important, right, as a necessary ingredient for, uh, ingredient for self-improvement. If, if we teach our children that, that, our, our, that, that our republic is not worth defending, who's going to volunteer to defend it in our, in our way of life? And I, I do think that, you know, in the academy in particular, uh, in, 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 in schools that sort of incubated critical theory broadly, elements of critical race theory and so forth, or that have been captured by what you might, I think, you know, overgenerally you know, categorize as the new left interpretation of history, that broadly you know, <laughs> defines historical experience as, as us as the problem, right? And us being the West broadly and all the ills of the world prior to 45 being due to colonialism, all the ills of the world after 1945 due to you know, capitalist imperialism. I think that this is just an inaccurate interpretation uh, of history and one that, that, actually, uh, you know, that actually undermines uh, our ability uh, to, uh, to, re you know, re to regain and, and, and maintain the confidence necessary. On that theme of agency, in, in the I Have a Dream address, King is, has helped to organize a national march on Washington to demand reform. And they're not uh, asking, they are demanding. There's a, in the public statement leading up to it. Uh, but, but in the beginning of the address, he, he refers to the architects of our republic, respectfully, who wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And then he quotes, paraphrases the Declaration of Independence. So somehow he's able to put together the idea that we have real problems now right. that, we, that demand uh, answers, and he's demanding them for the President and the Congress, but he believes in the founding principles and the ideals and the, and the frame of the right. laws. Right, and, and, and I think this, this is important. Again, this gets back to the, to the recognition that our republic was a, it was a work in progress from the beginning. Our founders really uh, were very much aware that our republic would require constant nurturing uh, and, and, and improvement. So that's what I think we ought to focus on. How do we build a, a better future? Uh, how do we strengthen our, our institutions and processes? You know, how do we ensure equality of opportunity for all, for all Americans? But so much of, the, of what you hear today is, is really emotional, it's superficial, uh, and, uh, and, and it, it tends to, to just drive Americans apart from each other. I really believe that if we can come together, like Schedule is, is organized to do, for meaningful, respectful discussions of the challenges we face, and just began with what we agree on, can you imagine how much we could get done? You know what I mean? We're going to disagree on some things, but we, we agree on a lot, right? I mean, who doesn't want every American to have access to the great promise of America? Who, wa who wants the conditions we have today where if you're born into a certain zip code, you know, you, 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 you're in the opt-out uh, system of education where if you have the means to opt out, you can opt out of a bad school district. But if you don't, by either sending your kids to private school or having the income to move to a, a neighborhood where the schools are better, then you're stuck. Why is that? 
right? And so, so if, if we agree that that's the objective, maybe we can realize that, that teachers' unions are a mixed blessing, to say the least, right? Maybe we would come to the conclusion that, that expanding school choice you know, to, to, to everybody might be a, a way out of, out of, out of this uh, problem that we haven't been able to solve for decades. Uh, on, the, <clears throat> on the theme of civic education, uh, I, I think a lot of Americans think of civics and civic education the way they think of dental care. You know, you, know you, you have to have it, uh, but haven't you had enough of it and you don't really want to think about it, right, again. Yeah. But, so I, I want to mention uh, to you, as I did already, uh, another very experienced national security leader <clears throat> who picked up on, on the topic that we had agreed to, right? We scheduled this months and months and months ago. You wrote about it in Battlegrounds. But Robert Gates, uh, former CIA director uh, and uh, Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, wrote in, in Politico, a national journal recently, uh, an op-ed entitled, How Civics Education Became a National Security Issue. So he's, yeah. he's echoing your theme. And so I want to mention the thesis that the lack of requirements to study American history and civics, political science, in universities it leads to the, the devaluing of lesser priority for history and civic study in K-12 schools. Right. And after decades and decades of that, the consequence is citizens, voters, and leaders who don't understand fundamental elements of our political constitutional system. And he picks out one, that the whole constitutional order, separation of powers, federalism, is designed to only work if there are compromises. Right. You have to listen to people who disagree with you. Right. And as much as you don't like it, you have to forge some kinds of governing compromises. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, it's, it's, it's set up for separation of powers because what our founders were afraid of was tyranny, right? And, and, uh, and we saw all, all, all of our institutions do their job uh, during the contested uh, you know, election uh, of, of 2020 and, and the assault on the Capitol. You saw when you had unfounded claims of widespread election fraud, you certainly saw that here in, in Arizona. You had a long experience with it, right? I mean, the process worked. I mean, the, the courts did what they needed to do. If you look on that, that terrible day of, of, uh, of January 6th, I see kind of a silver lining when you look at, at Senator McConnell's speech you know, that he gave right before the assault on the Capitol. And when you look at what the vice president did in doing his duty that day. So our institutions held up, they were stress tested, but these, this was not just you know, good luck. This was by design by our founders who had in mind the bloody wars, the bloody civil wars in England uh, in, in the 17th century and just didn't want that to happen here. There's a reason why, of course, the executive branch has no role in the transition of executive power at the national level. Right? It's for that very reason. So people were talking about, well, would the military have a role? Of course not. Heck no. No way. Because our, that's been thought out. Uh, you know, that was thought out uh, at the founding of our republic. So I think that you know, by seeing the, the stress we've been put under in the next year, maybe that can rekindle some interest in civic education. But you know who gets civic education? It is, it is immigrants to this country, those who achieve citizenship in this country. And this is why immigrants, I think, are our are, are strongest class of citizens. You know? and, and, and these are people who came to America to, to take advantage of the great promise of America, that solve the great poverty of America, that, 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 that bought into it, right? And, and know that, that, uh, that what is great about our country is that we do have an opportunity to build a better future for, for generations to come, right? If, we, if we're determined to, to work hard. And, and these are people who appreciate the fact that they have a say in how they're governed. These, these are people who, who are grateful for the opportunity for freedom of speech. And, and, and for uh, freedom of the press, because oftentimes they come from countries where wasn't, that wasn't the case. They're particularly grateful for rule of law, right? That nobody's gonna you know, break down their door in the middle of the night and drag them out of their, their, their house. They don't have to go to a warlord or a criminal group for protection, right? So, so I think that it really, our, our immigrants can be a part of the solution to this, right? <laughs> by, you know, by, by providing a model, as you do in the study as well, uh, of, of civic education and and how that's important as a, as a precondition for, for good citizenship. The, the study of history, as you mentioned, and the study of civics education, it, the, the idea is to prepare citizens, voters, and leaders for understanding that not, if, if something is important in life, it's complicated, right? Yeah. <laughs> from, from domestic policy and arguments 
that, that require compromise to pass laws and to pass policies to national security. So the, this idea of strategic narcissism, to, to rephrase it, is, is basically very sophisticated people in policy and academic discussions, but also voters and citizens somehow telling themselves, deluding themselves into thinking convenient ways of thinking are reality, no. rather than uh, figuring out how to sustain long-term but difficult policies, right? That right. a sustained approach to the war on terrorism or other national security threats is, is, w would require bipartisan agreement, right? Using our constitutional system to arrive at compromises. Mm -hmm. And then people elected and appointed willing to say, this is not gonna be an easy or short-term issue right. or, or policy. And that's not always gonna be popular, but it's the, it's the responsibility of people to talk, hopefully to citizens who studied and thought to, right. to say, okay, we accept, f first premise, none of this is gonna be easy. Yeah, I mean, when is the last time anybody heard a really clear explanation of our foreign policy, right? <laughs> they, 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 they talk to Americans about, here's what's at stake in the world today, and here's what we're going to do to integrate all of our elements of national power and efforts of like-minded partners to protect against the greatest dangers, to take advantage of opportunities, and build a better future for your children and your grandchildren. I, I don't think that that occurs enough uh, among our leaders. and. I mentioned you know, the, the dynamic in, in, in Afghanistan, the one-year war 20 times over, and, and the fact that really three presidents in a row told the American people that we ought to prioritize with withdrawal. It's not, it's not worth it. So when you look at the, at, the, at, at the public opinion polls and Americans weren't supporting what was a relatively low effort uh, with, with still entailing risk for those servicemen and women that are serving in Afghanistan, but with the Afghans bearing the brunt of the fight, at a sustainable level, a financial level, and level of true commitment, uh, no, no president made that case to the American people. So it should come as a surprise that there wasn't support for it. I think an area that, that provides a kind of a glimmer of hope is the adjustment in the policy toward China that was made in, in 2017 and, and, and 2018. And, and I think that has gained really bipartisan support. And, and it's, it's an example of, of, I think, clear communication of what is at stake and then also, really, it's an in in inescapable conclusion when you look at, at uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party's behavior just since the pandemic, for example. This is an element of continuity, I think, between the two administrations uh, and, and a recognition that, that the old strategy of cooperation and engagement with the Chinese Communist Party was no, was no longer effective, uh, and, and we needed to, a strategy of, of transparent competition. So um, we can do it, I think, but I think what we need is we need leaders who actually are more formative rather than performative, you know, who will explain, I think, these, you know, the, the, these problems that we're facing and the opportunities that we, that we want to exploit in, in greater detail and stop just going for sound bites like end endless wars, right? Explain really the nature of the situation, what is at stake and what is an appropriate policy response. Uh, but I think that, that also just acknowledging, as I mentioned in the beginning, the competitive nature of war, you know, especially, uh, but, but even the competitive nature of foreign policy, that it's a continuous uh, interaction. I do think that certain orthodoxies and theories uh, have, have really resulted in superficial thinking about these, these challenges and the, and the belief that what we do is decisive. It's really actually a profoundly arrogant approach to the world, right? Uh, I think those who, who have been influenced maybe by the new left interpretation of history because they define us as the problem, they think, well, then our disengagement is an unmitigated good. Now, I'll just give a couple examples, right? We often talk about the decision to, uh, to invade Iraq in 2003 uh, and whether it was right or wrong. I think we ought to talk more about who the heck thought it would be easy and what it would be easy. <laughs> but I think if you, if you see that as a manifestation of strategic narcissism, and in particular, being overly optimistic and not acknowledging uh, the, the agency that others have over the future, then I think you can make a similar argument about our complete disengagement from Iraq in 2011. Remember, this is when Vice President Biden called up uh, the President Obama in, uh, from Baghdad and said, thank you for allowing me to end this GD war, right? And, and, and think about the conceit that underlies that statement. Hey, the wars end when one side disengages. As if Al-Qaeda and Iraq looked around and said, hey, hey, the Americans are gone. I guess we'll just stop the jihad. Well, that's not what they did, right? They, they morphed into Al-Qaeda and Iraq 2.0 became ISIS. And you can see, I think, again, an example uh, in connection with the decision not to enforce the red line in Syria in 2013 and 2014. 
and the belief that the Syrian civil war can somehow be contained, right? And that our disengagement from the Middle East it was, it was actually beneficial, you know, because we were the problem. Well, of course, this began the, the serial episodes of mass homicide that were in the Syrian civil war. You know, half the Syrian population is dead, uh, wounded, or displaced. Uh, the refugees have strained surrounding countries and strained Europe uh, as well. And, uh, and I think you can draw a direct line, you know, between the decision not to respond to the, the mass murder of, of, uh, of hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of, of children uh, using the most heinous weapons on earth, to Russia's annexation of Crimea, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, China's building of, of violence in the South China Sea. I think that sometimes the cost of inaction is also high. And those who take this narcissistic view of the world, think that what we decide to do, or in this case not to do, is decisive, what you're doing is you're, you are not acknowledging the agency that others have over the future. It's actually often our disengagement you know, from the Middle East and the view of the Middle East as mainly a mess to be avoided right, is, is all often based on, on this belief that, that we are the problem. But, pe but countries, actors in the region, actually have aspirations and goals that are bigger than, that transcend those that are just in reaction to us. I mean, the, you know, the, the only theocratic, the, the Iranian theocratic dictatorship has been waging a four decade long proxy war against us. And so I, I think oftentimes we neglect really the nature of these competitions, because, again, because we, just, we, just, we think that whatever we decide to do is going to be decisive. Uh, <clears throat> final, <clears throat> excuse me, final question from me, and then, and then we will take uh, questions from the audience. Um, we've, I've asked you to talk about causes of our strategic narcissism, causes of our, our uh, polarization and our, our incapacity to, to forge compromises for sustainable policy. But I, I want to finish by taking a cue from your first book, Dereliction of Duty, which is pretty tough on your own profession. So I, I want to be tough on my own profession, yeah. <laughs> academics, uh, and, and because you, you are in both professions. So ask about, you just mentioned it, certain theories that are in American policy discussions and in intellectual life, theories about war and about international relations, which are narcissistic, but not really engaged with reality. So. My own discipline and profession, political science, is very fond of particular theories and dogmas about international relations, right. which can be criticized and have by some very good scholars as being, uh, the term I used to hear at the military academy, the Air Force Academy where I taught was that they're like self-licking ice cream cones, you know, <laughs> they're, they're not really engaged with understanding reality, but they're really nice and tidy as theories. And then, in, so comment on that if you would, and, and in history, right, that yeah. many history departments around the country in the United States are not replacing professors who are experts in diplomatic and therefore you know, military history as well because there are other subjects that are, that are more important. So the, the role of higher education in, in yeah. uh, being a cause of, of this strategic narcissism and failure to think in difficult and complex ways about the world. You know, I, I think it's a big problem. You know, the, old, the old joke that historians use on political scientists sometimes is you know, the political scientist says, okay, all right, all right, historian, you know, that works in practice, but will it work in theory, you know? So, so I, I, think, uh, I think there is this tendency, right, I think to, 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 to sort of force research and, and force evidence and, and an understanding of, of causality into the theory uh, instead of asking the right question and being open to all sorts of different uh, causal factors. And, and so, I, you know, as a historian, of course, I'm more biased uh, toward the, the latter than a, than a theoretical uh, construct. But I think where you can see this oftentimes is in, in maybe in some of the graduates of security studies programs. And they're not all the same. There are some, some that are, are really strong and are history based. But I think there's a tendency among a lot of people in Washington to think that, hey, if you write it in the policy memo, it's reality. I mean, and I can't tell you, when I, when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would get these, I would read the policies from Washington to try to place what we're doing in context. And it would have nothing to do with the reality on the ground. I mean, as to joke with one of my friends, uh, Colonel Joel Rayburn, when we were helping uh, Ambassador Crocker and General Petraeus rewrite the campaign plan for Iraq, that we were in Iraq, uh, but our strategies from Washington were based in Myrak. And, and Myrak can be like whatever you wanted it to be, you know? And, 
And, um, and, and, and I think that, uh, of course, if there isn't rigor in the process, if you're not applying design thinking, if you're not trying to understand challenges on their own terms, if you're not considering your rivals and enemies and adversaries and their actions, then you're creating space, right? That lack of rigor creates space for optimism bias, confirmation bias, and mirror imaging. There's a great book on this subject by my friend uh, Zachary Shore called Blunder, Why Smart People Make Dumb Decisions, right? And he describes each of these cognitive traps and uses historical examples of, of leaders who fell into those traps. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now it is the audience's turn. Uh, and we have, I think, just the one microphone here. And ask everyone to uh, think of questions uh, that are brief questions and that are really questions uh, for our guests, uh, rather, rather than prepared statements. So. Uh, some of the things that you're advocating, I think, well, probably all of them, require a certain trust in our government. And I want, wondered if you'd comment on my view that there are far too many breaches of that trust, and yeah. maybe two in particular. One that you are, I'm sure, familiar with, one is James Clapper's lying under oath to the Senate about the eavesdropping of American citizens. The second one that I'd like you to comment on is Stanley McChrystal's attempt to cover up the Pat Tillman reason for his death. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I'm not an expert on either one of those th those. Uh, examples you gave, and, and, uh, and I'm sure there, there are complexities involved with both of them. So I'll, what I'd like to do is maybe just address the issue of trust overall, right? And, and so uh, to, to answer your question, I'm going to use a Clinton quotation. And by Clinton, of course, I'm referring to George Clinton of Parliament Funkadelic, <laughs> uh, who, who in the 1970s came out with an album, America Eats Its Young. And one of the tracks on the album was, if you don't like the effect, don't produce the cause. Right? And, and I think that, you know, maybe we, to, to regain trust, we have to demand more from our leaders. Now, the two leaders you gave were appointed. They weren't elected officials. Uh, but I think accountability is important, and, and we have to demand better from our elected leaders. And in particular, I would say, especially demand that they don't compromise our principles to score partisan political points or to advance their own individual agendas. And, of course, you know, one of the uh, examples that, that, that is a brazen example is, is uh, are the false claims of widespread uh, fraud during the election that was propagated by the, you know, the Trump campaign and so forth, and then you know, the exhortations that I think contributed to the, you know, the assault on, on the Capitol. But there are other examples on the, on the other side. I, mean, I remember when Vice President Biden and candidate Biden, of course now President Biden, you know, he had said, well, you know, if, if President Trump doesn't leave the White House, you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff will just march him out. I think that was a dangerous comment to our democracy. And, and I think when the Speaker of the House called uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and surreptitiously, you know, I think taped the phone conversation and leaked it for partisan purposes, I think, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that these are, there's many, many more examples. But I think we ought to, you know, impose costs on, on politicians that, that behave in that, in that way. And, and uh, at the ballot box, right, where we, do, where we do have agency. And then maybe demanding more from the fourth estate. I mean, I, I am a big fan of our open press. Uh, but I do think that the business models have resulted in a lack of trust in them as well. And when you don't trust kind of, and there aren't authoritative sources of information, this is when these kind of crazy conspiracy theories like this QAnon nonsense and everything can, can creep into it. And how do we get to the situation where if you lean one way politically, you watch one cable news station. If you lean the other way, you watch one of two. And, and it's because they're doubling down on their most loyal audiences for business purposes. Uh, I think it, you know, it's, it's really lamentable that if you don't adhere to a certain orthodoxy, you can't write for the New York Times anymore. I don't know how many of you have read Barry Weiss's uh, letter uh, upon leaving the New York Times. It's brilliant, and I really recommend her, 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 uh, you know, her, her work on, uh, on Substack. And, uh, and, and so I, I think there's a lot of work to do to restore trust in institutions, our, our government certainly. Uh, and, and then, you know, I, I, I just think... Uh, uh, part of the theme has to be that we want our politicians to be more formative and less performative. I think it seems like everybody's always performing on a, for a camera or on social media. Thank you. Thanks. Next question. Hmm. Spenley Butler once remarked that war is a racket 
And frankly, I think the recent debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan prove the, the, high, the warnings left to us by Eisenhower that this has become a racket and then some in the current state of politics. With that said, I think it's fairly fair to say that there is no short deal of graft and corruption at every level of government, especially with regards to the military industrial complex. Thus, why should we not just discard the Republic? Why should we continue to have faith in institutions that are so evidently eaten away by parasites from within the state? Why? Okay, so uh, what's your question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, a, it's a simple one. Is, yeah. it, is it how would we reform it's the military institutions so that they don't well, have as much corruption? Or Well, it's the, to me, it's, it's not the military that seems quite the issue, but it's the institutional side of it from within the government, from within the republic. It's not the generals that are the ones cutting these absurd checks and making Lockheed Martin run away with yeah. large sums of money, creating this toxic policy. I think it's fair to say that there are men and women in Congress that, are, that have benefited from this catastrophe, yeah. benefited immensely, financially. It ought to be treasonous. Okay, well, you know, I, I think the question is like, I'll just give you my assessment. The military industrial complex exists, right? And I think the way to think of it is kind of a, the triangle of, you know, defense industry and business interests, as well as Congress and especially congressional members who like the funding going into their districts and the jobs that are created by defense contracts. And then, and then the, the Pentagon overall and, the, and the, the defense establishment. And that can create incentives that actually cuts against, you know, military readiness and, 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 uh, and spending our dollars more effectively to build up our defense capabilities. You know, oftentimes you hear the Pentagon put in a defense budget and Congress says, okay, well, you can have that, but then let, let me give you like 20 more of these aircraft that you didn't request, you know, or whatever ships that you didn't request. So those incentives are at work. And I think because we're in a democracy, the best, you know, the best counter to that is transparency uh, and, then, and then Americans understanding you know, the, the nature of this behavior and demanding, demanding better. And, and, uh, but you know, I, I think that, that there is sort of a, you know, there is sort of a, uh, you know, a, a new left interpretation of war broadly that I think you're alluding to, that it is economic incentives that, that for example, would explain the strategic failure and the waste uh, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. I really don't think that that is as bad of an issue as the incompetence um, among those who were administering, for example, aid programs that dumped dollars into Afghanistan well beyond the absorptive capacity of that economy uh, and of that government uh, that, had, that, that encouraged, you know, uh, that encouraged uh, corruption and the diversion of assistance in a way that kind of strengthened the Taliban but that also strengthened criminalized patronage networks who were stakeholders in state weakness uh, in Afghanistan. So I, I think that the premise of your question was a little, it was a little bit maybe doctrinaire. I would say if you have a question, you know, what was the role that, right, uh, the, the military industrial complex, and then define that, played in, in the strategic defeat or the incoherence and inconsistency of strategy in Afghanistan, that's a good work, that's a good research project and, and something to look into. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, Dr. McMaster. Uh, uh, my name is Shay Kitiri. You praise programs like Schedule, uh, Military History, you praise immigrants, journalists, and uh, Threat of China. Um, all of those, journalists, immigrants, uh, science graduates, <laughs> strategy <laughs> studies graduates, Schedule graduates, and work for Project 2049. Uh, so my question is that, uh, you talked about the problem with bad ideas, and I'm, right, I'm reading your colleague Stephen Kotkin's spelling biography right now, so I'm very aware of that problem. But is the imminent problem in America, the problem of bad ideas or poor character among senior leaders in government, uh, people who know better but don't do better? Yeah, I'll tell you, well, I, you know, um, I don't know, I, I mean, Certainly, we would want more from our leaders. And I guess the question that I would ask you, because you probably studied it closer than I have, it's not my area of expertise, is what, why does this system produce the candidates it produces, right? And so in a country of, you know, uh, uh, of 350 million people, I mean, I think we could maybe come up with those, with, with candidates who are stronger for, for public office in particular. Now, I think one of the reasons is who the heck wants to subject themselves and their families? Yeah to the process of running for office. Now, um, 
I, I think that, that we have to make the, the process of serving broadly, either as an appointed official or, uh, or running, easier. And then you have other related issues. Again, I'm not an expert on this, but I, you know, I'm around a lot of experts you know, here and, and at, uh, at the Hoover Institution. But I think also the gerrymandering of, of, uh, of, of districts, such that those districts are no longer competitive, and that <clears throat> once, you, once you win the primary you know, in a, of a certain party, you're gonna win the election. So what you can do is kind of play more to the extremes and then not really affect the kind of compromise and, and rational approach. And then now add on to that the information environment and then who the heck wants to, you know, wants to run when you're just going to get attacked by a mob of trolls on, you know, I mean, it's just, so I just think we, we have a lot of work to do to make public service and elected office more accessible to more high quality people. So I'm grateful for those who do run. You know, I, I have some, you know, some good dear friends in the Senate and, and in, in the House who are really dedicated public servants who want to do the right thing for the country, who work across the aisle. And so we just need more of them, I think. And, um, but I, I mean, I, do you have any thoughts on that? Like what, what do you, what do you, uh, you know, what, what, how, how do we, how do we get better uh, candidates? For the reception. <laughs> yeah, Sounds yeah, yeah. good. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'll invite that, so. Yeah, thank you. Next, next uh, question. Um, thank you, General. Um, I'm faculty here in Skettle. I'm also a, 12-year um, veteran in the Air National Guard. I was an NCO. Uh, I promised Paul that I would ask you an easy question, so here it goes. Um, thinking about your, your concept of uh, strategic empathy, I'm wondering if there's a corollary to that um, in how leaders manage uh, the relationship between democracies and institutions, as you just mentioned in that last answer. For the audience's sake, two quick points. Tocqueville says democracies are really bad at making foreign policy because the electoral incentives are too strong. They're always going to be short term, right? Yeah. Since the end of the Cold War, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, every single one of them had been elected predominantly on a I'm not going to get involved in foreign policy sort of, you know, campaign. It seems as though then that there's an element to sort of where we are now that the reason we fought 21 year wars is because that's what the electorate wants. And that the leaders know that they're constrained by that. If we could go back to September 12th, 2001, and any one of us could probably do it, what should we have been telling Bush or even a young Obama about what they would need to be doing given those constraints, given that they're gonna fall victim to this incentive to cut and run sooner rather than later and not make that strategic uh, long game possible? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of it just, Partisan politics infected foreign policy, especially after the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And then I think what President Obama did, and I read about this pretty extensively in, in Battlegrounds, is he defined his foreign policy mainly as an opposition uh, to, to, the, to the invasion of, of Iraq. And he, he, I think he tended to see everything through, the, through that particular lens. And, uh, and then, you know, this is not the first time, right, that there's been, you know, changes in administration that say, okay, I, I'm going to go from massive retaliation to flexible response, right, between uh, the Eisenhower and the Kennedy administrations, for, for example. But there were certain elements of continuity that carried through, that, that you need a sustained effort, I think, against jihadist terrorists, uh, be, because once, you know, once jihadist terrorists reach your shores, you can only deal with them at an exorbitant cost, right, like 9-11. But you need to re remain engaged in the world in the area of health security, right, because once a pandemic reaches your shores, it can only be dealt with at an exorbitant cost. Uh, we, have, you know, we have a threat from the Chinese Communist Party that if they succeed, uh, the world will be less free, less prosperous, and, and less safe. So I think these all ought to be elements of, of continuity in foreign policies between administrations. And, and having had the role of, of, uh, of, of helping uh, President Trump develop the, the national security strategy in December 2017, with the help of some great people, including Dr. Nadia Shadlow, who's who ran that effort, I think if you go back to that document, and if you don't like, you know, Donald Trump, just block out the words America first, right? <laughs> or whatever, whatever triggers you about Donald Trump. But I think we, we wrote that to, to be a persuasive document to Americans, regardless of what your political party was. And I hope that that will stand the test of time. So I, I think that, that my greatest hope for bringing people together is in the area of foreign policy. That's why I wrote the book that I wrote, because you know, 
it does, if you're a Democrat or Republican, does that mean you're for North Korea with the most destructive weapons on Earth? <laughs> no, are you, you know, are you for uh, China weaponizing its statist mercantilist model against us to disadvantage American workers and, and American companies? You know, if you're a Democrat or Republican, are you for Putin's campaign of, of disruption, disinformation, and denial that are trying to drag us down and polarize us and pit us against each other and reduce our, our confidence in our, in our democratic institutions and processes? So I, I think I'm hopeful that we can use foreign policy to bring Americans together. I hope, I hope that's the case. When I was National Security Advisor, we, we also engaged across the aisle on, on our big policy issues, tried to lay the groundwork for sustained bipartisan support uh, on, on the Hill. Uh, but ultimately, you know, this comes a lot down to presidential leadership, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and the president's ability to make a compelling case to the American people and to, to, to the representatives in Congress. And, um, you know, I just haven't seen that leadership across now multiple administrations. Thank you. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, my question is uh, for you, sir. Uh, so in terms of current here adversaries, so we mentioned, you know, Russia, China, Iran. How do we weigh that cost of inaction versus our confidence that on their own they're doomed to fail because of the types of government they are? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that what we have to do is we have to defend against, you know, pernicious efforts to put us in a position of disadvantage. And, and this is the, the strategy for, I'll just take China as an example. I described that the, the Chinese Communist Party strategy is one of co-option, coercion, and concealment, right? To, to co-opt countries and companies, financial institutions and others, uh, through the lure of short-term profits or access to the lucrative Chinese market or cheap manufacturing. But then once you're in, right, to use that dependence for coercive purposes, right, to, to get you to transfer your intellectual property and sensitive technologies, to, uh, to, to turn a blind eye to their most egregious abuses like, like genocide in Xinjiang or the repression of, of freedom in, in Hong Kong or the threats to Taiwan. And then to conceal all this is just normal business practices, right? So to defend it, the, the best defense against that is, again, pull the curtain back, transparency, uh, and, and then also to, to, you know, to, to again, you know, if you don't like the effect, don't produce the cause. Don't underwrite our own demise uh, with investments in China that cover their bad bets that they make for strategic gain, for example. So there's, there's a defensive aspect. But I think to the, these competitions, there's also you know, a, a, an aspect of, of strengthening our competitive advantages. You see this beginning to play out in Congress with emphasis on research and development funds for emerging de technologies that are very important to us remaining competitive in the emerging data-driven global economy or in advanced manufacturing, but are also very important in maintaining our, our differential advantages militarily. And then why, this is all competition, right? Below the threshold of what we don't want to imagine, which would be a, a destructive war, right? And, and actually, uh, you know, the best way to prevent war is to be prepared for it. So ensuring that we have deterrent capabilities, which are, I think, essentially as deterrence by denial, by convincing in this case, Chinese Communist Party leadership and the People's Liberation Army, they could not accomplish their objectives through the use of force because of our defense capabilities that we have, but also the, the capabilities of, of, of our allies and, and others. Uh, if you look at Taiwan as maybe the most dangerous uh, you know, flashpoint with China, it may be along with the South China Sea, uh, really Taiwan is in a race to develop, to, to strengthen its own deterrence capabilities with arms purchases from us, reforms within its military, and that's really important for us to support. The Japanese self-defense force, uh, who have been under duress and threat uh, from, uh, from China, especially in the Senkaku's Islands, is also making some very significant defense reforms associated with reinterpretation of the Constitution and maybe the integration of, of other defense capabilities that, that all contribute to, 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 to deterring China. So I think this is the way to think about it, is a combination of deterrence and then, of course, competition. Competition to defend. Uh, against Chinese economic aggression and industrial espionage and so forth and cyber-enabled industrial espionage, uh, but then also to, to, to make sure we strengthen and preserve our competitive advantages, especially in areas where China weaponizes this, this status mercantilist model against us in a way that, that, uh, that, that uh, you know, that, that, uh, you know um, attacks weakness, what they see as weaknesses in our free market economic system. Okay, thank, thank you, you sir. Hello, a question for the general. Um, 
So you were talking earlier, and forgive me if you answered this because I did miss part of your speech. Um, you were talking about basically our duty to get involved in, in the things going on in the Middle East. Um, but my question is, um, based on the history of the Middle East and what's, what's gone on there for centuries, do you think there actually is a winning strategy? Is it perhaps something uh, along the Wilsonian model of making the world safe for democracy? And if it is, how do you accomplish that goal? Yeah. Hey, we're not going to solve the problems of the Middle East. I mean, there's no, right? And, and, but, but, you know, I, I think what I, what I, what I uh, argue for in, in, uh, in battlegrounds is a sustained, uh, a sustained effort in the Middle East uh, that allows us to at least help ensure the situation doesn't get worse, right? I, basically, I say that, you know, this idea that the Middle East is mainly a mess to be avoided and our disengagement is an unmitigated good is based on two flawed assumptions. One, it, one is that the situation just can't get worse, right? They've been fighting each other for centuries. Well, it actually can get worse, and we saw it get worse in the context of the, of the Syrian civil war, the rise of ISIS, and the, and, and the uh, return of large-scale sectarian violence in Iraq, you know, the humanitarian catastrophe in, in, in Yemen. And then the second assumption is that problems in the region you know, just stay in the region. They don't, right? They don't adhere to, you know, to as Ken Pollock has observed about the region, that, you know, it's not like Las Vegas rules, right? What stays in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. What happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And, and we've seen that with, uh, with a cer certainly uh, jihadist terrorism uh, in particular. And what I argue in the book is that the fundamental problem in the Middle East now is a cycle of sectarian violence that has thrust the entire region into a, destruct, in a destructive sectarian civil war that has created a humanitarian catastrophe, but it's also empowered Iran in the region. Iran, who wants to, to extend influence across the region, that wants to keep the Arab world perpetually weak and enmeshed in conflict, and to threaten Israel with destruction by placing a proxy or, army on the border of Israel, but also uh, endeavoring to obtain the most destructive weapons on earth. That cycle of sectarian violence also keeps jihadist terrorist organizations on life support because beleaguered Sunni Arab communities then look at jihadist terrorists as patrons and protectors. And so it is in our interest to do everything we can from a diplomatic standpoint, from a limited military standpoint, to help arrest that cycle of violence, begin to address the humanitarian crisis, and help move with others in the region toward accommodations, political accommodations, that, that help uh, restore security and stability in the most troubled parts of the, of the region. So I think without us, uh, the region gets worse. And, and you see that in hedging behavior. We keep saying, okay, we keep saying the Middle East. Okay, we're leaving. Okay, now we're really leaving. Now this time, we're really, really leaving. Yeah. We never really leave the Middle East, but in saying that we're always leaving, we, we, we forfeit all the benefits of a long-term commitment, especially in terms of our influence. So what, what happens in a, in a concrete way is countries in the region look to others, China and Russia in particular, to hedge, right? This is why the UAE has entered in, in a much more deeper, a much deeper uh, economic relationship with China. It's why the Saudis buy S-300 uh, air defense systems from them. And it's why Putin can get away with what I would call Putin's Potemkin peace plan in Syria. How's that for alliteration? Uh -huh. and, and essentially what he's saying is, what he's saying is that, that hey, you know, sign up for keeping Assad in power and guaranteeing Russian interests in a post-Civil War Syria. And what I'll do for you, and now he whispers, you know, is I'll help limit Iranian influence over time. And this is what he says to the Arab states, what he says to Israel. Of course, it's a lie, right, because it's Putin and he always lies. But it's also a lie because uh, Assad is much more reliant on the Iranians than he is on, 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 on the Russians. But he gets away with it, right, because we, all, we say we're always leaving. Well, we are running short on time, so I'm going to ask for three brief questions okay. and three brief answers. I'm going to have to remember them, too. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, go ahead. Okay. First, I'd just like to thank you for coming out and speaking to us. Um, you spoke about the important American principle of always trying to create a better, per more perfect union. Um, and you spoke about this through uh, the Civil War and fighting for civil rights. And you talk about how important it is to have civil rights throughout America. Um, as we often ignore in America, throughout the country there are lots of people who do not have civil rights, such as the Uyghurs in concentration camps in China, and all these, there's lots of people who are still sort of enslaved in Africa. At what point do you think these despots, how far do they have to go before we should engage and use our more perfect union to 
help those people earn their civil rights. Good. There's a simple yeah. question that deserves a brief okay. answer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Hey, I'll just say I'll just say quickly. The American people have to buy into the efforts. You have to explain to the American people why it is in their interest because they have to sustain it. We had this thing for years, as you know, called right to protect. The people who wrote the doctrine of right to protect are serving in the administration that just threw the Afghans under the bus on our way out of Afghanistan. So I think it's an extraordinary example of hypocrisy. So what we have to be able to do, first of all, I think, is make sure that our actions match our words, right? You know, that you know, in, this, in the same speech that President Biden said, we're leaving Afghanistan on this date certain, he then said that human rights were foundational uh, to, to, to his policy. I mean, how do you think Afghans regard those words, right? So, so I, I think that we have to do, make a better case to sustain those kind of efforts. The, the lack of intervention in the Rwanda genocide is one of the most powerful historical examples of a missed opportunity to, 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 uh, to, to have prevented a mass atrocity, right? We didn't do it then. Why didn't we do it? What can we do differently when it is within our agency to affect these? Now, we did intervene in Bosnia and Kosovo, right? And, and I think the United States I mean, rarely gets credit for it, especially in American university history programs, you know? But because we're often cast as the problem. But I, I think it has a lot to do with just will, the American people understanding what's at stake, and then what we can do, what, it, what, is, what is in our power to do. Great. Thank you so much. Next, thank you. the next easy, brief question. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks. I do have one question. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, uh, how, how do you forecast um, China and the new Afghan government um, working together to the to the real um, American um, liberties. China okay. and the new. Uh, how do you forecast China and the new Afghan government, the Taliban, okay. um, working yeah. together to the real American liberties? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's it's clear that the the Chinese are, are already accommodating with the Taliban. So are the Russians. So are the Iranians. And of course, the Pakistanis helped. You know, this was a Pakistani offensive. Uh, essentially, that led to the collapse in Afghanistan. So what you're seeing is kind of a return of great game competition to Afghanistan that's reminiscent of the, of the uh, 18th and, and, uh, and early 19th centuries. And, uh, and I think when you look at what China's trying to do, you have to look at what they're doing more broadly in South Asia and Central Asia as, as well, with the development of infrastructure that creates dependence on, on China and that gives China uh, access uh, from a geostrategic standpoint and creates dependencies and servile relationships. The China-Pakistan economic cor corridor and the Corricum Highway and, and, uh, and the developing of the port of Gwadar, all these are examples of, I think, what will, is going to carry over, certainly, into, into Afghanistan. And um, uh, I, just, I don't know what's going to happen in, in, in Afghanistan. I think it would be a big mistake for us to do anything that is seen as supportive of this Taliban government. Uh, I think it is a, a government that will fail. And, and, and while our impulse will be to provide humanitarian assistance, we just have to make sure we don't do it in a way that strengthens the Taliban. We ought to be try, trying to ensure that the Taliban government fails, in my view. Every time I hear somebody say, hey, we need to engage the Taliban on the future of Afghanistan. Hey, how about engaging other Afghans, right, who don't want to live under Taliban rule uh, on the future of Afghanistan? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Uh, thank you, General. I thought um, in your speech you had a lot of um, insightful things to say, um, but I noticed one thing in particular that you said was that you want to um, try to unite Americans through um, foreign policy. So what I was wondering is, currently foreign policy is one of the, the least, consequential, um, least consequential issues in, in honestly deciding elections. Yeah. I believe that's shown in opinion polling, that's shown in during the Afga Afghanistan fiasco, a lot of commentators were saying, well, this isn't going to really affect the midterms because Americans just right. won't care about it. Right. So I'm wondering how you believe that foreign policy can help unite Americans if it's such an overlooked topic um, yeah. in, in politics. Well, you know, I think, I think it's all about how it's framed, right? I think you have to answer the so what question. Why do people care, right? And I think in the competition with China and especially that, that, the, that uh, the, the transitions in the American economy that occurred as a result of China's accession into the World Trade Organization, even before that in the 1990s, receiving most favored nation status, that affected right all, all Americans and led to transitions in the global economy that left big portions of, of the American population behind. Right, So I think in the competition with China, it's, a, it's a kind of an easy sell. 
uh, in terms of explaining why it's important for us to compete more effectively, right, and to abandon the assumption that China, you know, having been welcomed into the international order, would liberalize its economy, play by the rules, and as a prosper, liberalize its form of governance. Okay, we know that's not going to happen. And so, you know, I think other examples I include, you know, jihadist, the fight against jihadist terrorists, right? And, and you know, there are those who want to kind of just declare it over, right, to disengage. But explaining to the, to the American people, of course, you know, that, that these, these wars don't end when one side disengages and that really a relatively small commitment that enables others to bear the brunt of that fight, right? Our allies and partners internationally is in our interest. And, and of course, to use the examples not only of 9-11, of but to use the ISIS-inspired attack in San Bernardino or the failed Times Square attack in 2014, I think, right? Uh, where, that, where, that, where that bomber was ineffective because he was dodging our counterterrorism efforts in, in, in Pakistan. So I, I think our leaders, I think, have forgotten that it's important to, to explain policies to the, to the American people and why it's important. And so, again, I, I hope a lot of people read Battlegrounds, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, the reason I wrote the book is because is, is in part to answer the so what question. The other thing, if I could just shamelessly plug uh, a podcast I do uh, called unimaginatively, I guess, Battlegrounds. Battlegrounds. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's long-term, uh, it's long-format interviews with world leaders mm -hmm. to generate this, the, the term from Zachary Shore, strategic empathy, right? To view the challenges from the perspective uh, of, of others. And, and uh, you know, I think that a lot of it just has to do with education. Now, the way the Biden administration has approached it is to say, hey, we're gonna have a foreign policy for the middle class. I still don't understand what that means, you know? But, uh, but, uh, but I think it was an effort at least to explain, hey, you know, foreign policy is still important, uh, but but I, I think that that Americans, if they have access to the the rationale for for a policy, uh, they'll understand it. The, 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 I mean, and, and support it, and it can maybe help bring us together. But I think you're right, though. I concede. I can I concede your point that there are a lot of issues that are that are more top of mind for Americans, and I don't think we're going to bring Americans together through foreign policy exclusively. I think we have to focus on just bringing our country together, period. And I hope that maybe you're know, doing so through the challenges we face internationally holds some promise, right, for sort of arresting these centripetal forces uh, that we see tearing us apart. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I have a few closing remarks, and uh, and then we have a reception. So I'm standing between you and a reception. Uh, all the students first, and any family and friends here who care about university students, we hope you will get information on the school, on our courses. We have a major and minor for undergraduates. We have a master's degree. And you can see the flyers on some of the chairs. We have a new undergraduate certificate in philosophy, politics, and economics, PPE. Can I make uh, a plug here? I just went to the Ed Plus team. I mean, the, the online content that ASU is developing is phenomenal. It really is, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, uh, and we, we have, and some of our courses are online uh, as well. Um, we also, for everyone present, we hope you'll pick up a schedule of our, our speaker events for the remainder of this semester and keep an eye on our website for events we have coming in the spring. Uh, later this month, we have Jonathan Rauch from the Brookings Institution and writer for The Atlantic talking about his book on freedom of speech, civil debate, and, and recovering the idea of truth, arguing to find uh, the truth. Uh, and in November, we have the first of a, of a mini-series of events called Can We Talk Honestly About Race? And we're going to have Glenn Lowry from Brown University and Khalil Mohammed from Harvard University disagreeing in a civil and reasonable way about the causes of racial disparities. Are you allowed to do that? In America yeah. today. We are going to try. All right. Okay, all right. We're, Good luck. We're going to try. I'm yes. so glad you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so glad you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So then, thanks to the team in our school, uh, I already said thank you to Arizona PBS, but the team in our school that makes these events possible and does all the planning, I'm just the pretty face uh, up here, gets to enjoy these terrific interviews and events. Especially want to thank Dr. Carol McNamara, our Associate Director of the School for Public Programs, Morgan Raddick, who is our events coordinator, other staff uh, in the events team and the communications team in the school, including Marcia Brookie, who's our communications director and also our student workers. Uh, speaking of podcasts, Battlegrounds, the Hoover Institution uh, podcast, our own podcast is called Keeping It Civil, uh, and Jenna McMaster did an interview for that earlier today. So you can find that on our, our, web, uh, our own website, the school's website, on iTunes, on Podbean, Podbean wherever you find podcasts. 
So with that, I hope you will stay and join us for the reception. We hope to see you at future events in the Civic Discourse Project. And please join me in a final thank you to General H.R. McMaster. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>